So hopefully it's an interesting topic for you. Um, you know, but first of all, uh, let's think about the question, you know, what, what is marriage? And I just wanted to show you, you know, obviously we'll be going to Genesis in the beginning when God actually created marriage and created Adam and Eve. I just wanted to show you this interesting verse in Ezekiel 16, verse 8. Because I believe marriage, it, it, it's hard because sometimes when topics are, are very basic and fundamental, it's hard to just think of a concise uh, definition or statement to describe it. Um, but I've, I, I think this would accurately describe it. It's probably not all encompassing, but I've, I've said here that marriage is a covenant of fidelity between one man and one woman. I thought this verse here in Ezekiel 16, 8 was interesting because it says here, Now when I passed by thee, and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. So if you read the whole chapter of Ezekiel 16, it's about you know, God likening you know, Israel uh, to a lady, and you know, he, he found this lady, and then he ended up marrying marrying her, but then and made her look beautiful and, and decked her with jewels, and then she then you know uh, went and and committed whoredoms and fornications and adultery, and basically the parable, the 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 analogy there is that Israel uh, and and Israel's idolatry is likened to uh, you know adultery uh, of the marriage that uh, God had with Israel. Because I was always wondering when I was thinking about marriage, you know, is marriage the covenant or is it the fact that a man and a woman sleep together? But it can't be, obviously, because it can't just be the sleeping together because that, otherwise what's fornication if that's uh, um, if without the covenant? But then I thought, well, but is marriage, uh, you know, sleeping together with a covenant? And that's the point where you're married. But then I don't think that made sense either because it talks about, you know, people being betrothed being a husband and wife. So uh, obviously somebody that's betrothed but haven't come together yet are still husband and wife, so they're still technically married. So I, I am, I am uh, pretty certain that marriage is just purely that covenant. It's that promise that we enter into uh, with one man and one woman, and we promise to be faithful to the exclusion of all others, others as it says in Australia, um, under the marriage laws. So I thought that was an interesting verse there, but let's go to Genesis 2 in the beginning. Uh, where we actually see uh, the marriage of the first man and the first woman. It says here in verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had, ma had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So we see here that, that this is the covenant that a man and a woman take, that, they, that, that Adam takes this woman to be his wife and now they are treated as one flesh. And you know, it's funny that they say, you know, a joke they'll say is, you know, you know, Eve must have been a very beautiful woman because when Adam saw Eve, he said, whoa, man, uh, and called her woman. That's one that I've heard. So, but we, what we see here that, you know, it's, it's a covenant between one man and one woman. And it's a monogamous relationship. So it's not polygamous, meaning it's, it's one man and one woman. It's not one man and two women or two, um, two men and, and one woman. Um, it's monogamous, it's not polygamous. And we see here that God said here in verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his, his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We see later in uh, Ephesians, I won't turn there, but it says they too shall be one flesh. So two makes one flesh. And you know, when God made a wife for Adam, he didn't make two women, did he? He just made one woman and brought one woman to the man. So it's, it's monogamous. But I want to show you a couple of other verses just so we can see that we can support uh, monogamous marriage in the Bible. Because a lot of people will say, well, you know, people in the Bible had multiple wives. Does God allow multiple wives? Well, just because people had multiple wives in the Bible, that doesn't mean that's what, what, God, that's what God's intention was. God always intended a one man and one woman. 
So we see here in Exodus 20, one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So we know in the, in the Bible there are certain punishments for adultery, uh, different ways God deals with adultery and things like that. But we know one of the commandments is not to commit adultery. So once a person is married, God wants that, ex that relationship to be exclusive. Uh, Deuteronomy 17. 17, when we see the commandment given to uh, the kings of Israel. It says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Look at this. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And, and so on and so forth. So the rules given to the leader of the nation of Israel was to have one wife. And we see also that in um, the New Testament, when we see the leaders in the church setting, the, the bishops and the deacons, it says a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So you, you do not meet the qualifications of being a bishop if you have multiple wives. Um, and it is possible to have multiple wives. Uh, but you, you know we see here that God's intention, obviously, if the standard for being a leader and an example in the church is one wife, that is God's intention. God's, in, God's intention from the very beginning. So yes, men in the Bible did have multiple wives, but it's a sin, it's adultery, and it was never God's intention. <coughs> Now, the other thing, not only is marriage monogamous, so it's one man and one woman, but it's, um, it's only till death. So Romans 7, we see here, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. So we see there that the law, that law of marriage and that covenant only lasts until one of the, um, either the man or the wife die, and then they're no longer bound by the law. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And I'll come back to that verse a bit later. Now let's go to Matthew. Because a lot of people will say, yeah, okay, marriage is one man between, uh, marriage is between one man and one woman, and it's for life, till death to us part. Um, so why then is there a condition upon which people can put away their wife in, in Matthew? And I'm not going to go full on into this, this topic today. I think I will in the coming weeks about you know, adultery, fornication and divorce. But I just wanted to show you, to show you this verse here in uh, Matthew chapter 19. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So they're saying, is it, is it right for a man to just divorce his wife for any reason? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So we read that in uh, verse uh, in Genesis 2. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain, so two, so not three, should be one flesh. And you know with this, this whole gay marriage thing, you know, it's, it's funny because people are now trying to make the case for uh, a three-person marriage, a polygamous marriage. And you know what they've coined it? A thruple? Have you guys heard of that word? So instead of a couple, it's a threesome couple. So this thruple is the new you know, human right that uh, people can have multiple wives. Anyway, so, so wherefore they are no more twain, so there's the two, not the three, but one flesh. What, God, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. 
Now watch this. Then say unto him, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. So we see there was never God's intention for divorce. It was one man, one woman for life until death to his part. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So he says that, so there is, we see there are grounds for divorce. I'm not going to go into what that is today, but we see there that there is one exception where that marriage vow can be broken, and it is lawful. But what does he mean there where he says, because of the hardness of your hearts, in verse 8, Moses suffered you to put away your wives. And, and you know, there's two ways to think of this, because I, I always thought maybe it was, you know, because man didn't want to uh, keep God's initial intention to, to stay married to his wife, um, even because of fornication, that God allowed this, um, uh, this, this, this precept. But because God in the Old Testament uses this analogy and I guess puts away Israel when you see in the Old Testament and gives her a writing of divorcement, it can't be wrong in and of itself if God has created this commandment because he can't be sinning. So I just wonder if the hardness of your hearts is not referring to the husband wanting to put away his wife, but the fact that you know, people are committing fornication and this is why this law exists. It's kind of like, you know, laws in the Bible about how to deal with murder, how to deal with kidnapping, how to deal with these things. And God can almost say the same thing. It's like Moses wrote you this precept because of the things you were doing. God never intended anyone to commit fornication. God never intended anyone to put away his wife. But then because of these things and because of the hardness of your heart, these things are happening, these precepts exist. Uh, that's my understanding of it. Because it can't be wrong in and of itself if God himself uh, uses that analogy and puts away fornicating Israel. I'll go into that further in another, at another time. So it's, till de it's one man, one woman. This is God's intention. Till death do us part. That's the vows that we take when we get married. So because marriage is this covenant that a man and a wife enter into, and that's what allows them to do the things that married couples but only married couples should do. If a marriage happens, or a marriage, quote unquote, happens without this covenant, I believe God sees that as fornication. And why do I say that? Because I didn't know that in some cultures, marriages don't have a covenant. Um, and, and even in, I, I think, I, I supposedly, because a Muslim, an ex-Muslim person told me this, that in the, in the Muslim marriage, there isn't a covenant. It's simply just somebody taking, you know, a wife, and you know buying her basically so which is not necessarily wrong you know this is why i think the bible talks about selling your daughter as a handmaiden i don't think it's selling her into slavery i think it's you know you know somebody purchases her as a wife and you might say oh you, should, you know why is somebody purchasing her as a wife how could she be property well you know children are property i think women are also property of men and men ultimately are property of god so there's nothing wrong with being property it's it's how you treat people it's just i think we we seem to uh, just n normally link the word property with dehumanizing people, but that's not the case, just like we see servanthood in the Bible. Anyways, I, I don't know where I was going with that, but um, so, so we see in the Bible, you know, uh, I was just thinking, what, what was the point I was trying to make again uh, before I got off on that rabbit trail? Covenant. Oh, yes, covenant. So, so in Islam, you know, if you marry somebody and there's no covenant, then it's fornication. And I think we just have to be wary of that because I didn't know that in Islam that there is no covenant. If there isn't a covenant, then technically those people aren't married and they're just living in a fornicating relationship. And they need to make that covenant, uh, I think, to legitimize their marriage in the eyes of God. Uh, numbers. 30. Now, one thing you might not know, but it's interesting in the Bible that a, a virgin woman, a woman that has not been divorced, that has, her husband has not died, cannot make a vow without her father's permission. And, you know, we, we sort of have that tradition uh, and practice in, in our culture to get the father's permission, right? If you want to marry a, a lady, the, the father needs to approve of that. And I believe that that's actually biblical because a, a young lady is unable to make a vow unless her father allows her, and her, va her father is actually able to veto her vow. Look in uh, Numbers 30 here. 
It says, verse 3, If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she had bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she had bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any, of her, uh, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she had bound her soul shall stand and the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. And then it goes on to say like, you know, if, if a woman has a husband, it's the same issue. She can't make a vow without her husband allowing that and her husband can veto that vow. So this practice in weddings of fathers giving away the bride, you know, allowing that marriage to take place is actually biblical. Um, because if he says, no, you're not marrying my daughter, he can allow that vow not to take place. And if you go ahead and sleep together and get married, you're actually committing fornication because you're not in a covenant that is seen in the eyes of God. But it's interesting when we see later on, I just don't know if I can find it. Uh, look here in verse 9. But every vow of a widow... And of her that is divorced, wherewith they have bound their soul, shall stand against her. And if she vowed in her husband's house, or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, and her husband heard it, and held his peace at her, and disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. So we see here that if a woman is under the authority of a man, either a husband or a father, she can't make a vow without that authority allowing her to make that vow. But if a woman is no longer under that authority, like in verse 9, if she's a widow, meaning her husband has died, remember she's loosed from the law, or she's divorced, or her husband has put her away, then she's able to marry another person or, or enter into another vow uh, without the permission of an authority as she no longer has one over her. Okay, Malachi 2. Now when you get married... Are, are other witnesses required? Because, you know, normally when we get married legally, you have to have witnesses to sign that marriage. And, you know, people would generally say, oh, you know, a marriage needs to be witnessed by, you know, either, you know people say God's people or by uh, other people. You know, are other witnesses required? I personally don't think so. I think if you got married and uh, there was no witnesses, you would still be married. But I think at least the father has to be a witness. Because if you're marrying somebody who's under an authority, the father has to you know, be, allow her, his daughter to be given away. But if you marry, like, say, a widow or somebody that's divorced, you don't need to have a wit witnesses because witnesses are not the ones that legitimize the marriage. I believe the only witness that needs to legitimize a marriage is God. I think the reason why we generally in our society get married with a lot of people because we want to celebrate that covenant, right? We want to get people together to celebrate when they make that witness but they make that covenant, but if there are no witnesses to make that covenant, it doesn't invalidate that covenant. I believe it's just something that is legally required, but the government is not the one that legitimizes a marriage. So, <clears throat> so are other witnesses required? In Malachi 2, we read here in uh, verse 14, it says, Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. So we see there in verse 14 that God is the only one that needs to be witness between you and your wife. Because if other witnesses were required, who, who witnessed Adam and Eve's wedding? You see what I mean? There weren't any other people around, unless you count the animals to be witnesses. So... I don't believe other witnesses are required to legitimize marriage. I think the vow is between a man and a woman with a father's position, uh, permission. But I think generally witnesses are only are required to fulfill legal requirements um, and either for social reasons to share the experience. So does, it need, does a marriage need to be uh, recognized by law to be legitimate? No. So if two people get married and they don't sign some legal paper to submit to the government, are they not married? No, they are married because the, the marriage is the covenant that they make between one another, between them, and God is the witness to legitimize that marriage. I think a lot of people just, and even with um, Gershon and Christine's marriage, do the signing at the same time, just I think out of convenience and, 
and things like that. But some people, you know, they go and do the signing and they get legally married before they have their ceremony and some people do it after. Um, but if you don't have the legal, uh, the legal paperwork in place, that does not make your marriage illegitimate. You're married, um, you know, whether or not there are human witnesses and whether or not there are uh, legal requirements fulfilled. You know, because the government doesn't validate your marriage. You don't need a marriage certificate to prove that you're married. I know some people take the position that, oh, you know, a marriage has to be in law because then otherwise, how could you enforce laws that pro prohibit adultery, right? Because then how could you prove that they're married if somebody commits adultery? If you don't have the marriage license to prove they're married, how can you then execute the death penalty for people that commit adultery? Well, you don't need to have a marriage certificate. You don't need the government to recognize your marriage for everybody to know that you're married. Because you can still have people witness and testify and say, yes, you know, the father can testify first of all and say, yeah, I gave this woman to be, to be his wife. And that can be one way you can prove a marriage. You don't need to necessarily have a marriage license and for the government to sanction your marriage for it to be legitimate.